Well, good morning, Grace Place family. It's so good to be with you today. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to our online sermon video. I'm excited that you are here. I want to go over a few announcements to keep you all informed. So remember, our Sunday morning outdoor service is at 10 a.m., and that service does have kids' ministry from kindergarten to fifth grade. And then on Sunday nights at 6 p.m., the youth ministry is meeting and having youth service. We are having Wednesday night services as well. They are completely outdoors, and that's at 7 p.m. We have groups for men's and women's, and that's happening in the blacktop parking lot of the church. And then we have Rural Rangers, Girls Ministry, and Youth, and that's happening over at the church property, uh, over at the church house, and that's all outdoors. Fridays, uh, the Young Adult Ministry is having their Fire Pit Fridays uh, on at 6 p.m., so please uh, check out their Facebook page for details on that. And uh, that's all the ministry opportunities that we have uh, during this season. They're, they're incredible. They're wonderful. So I encourage you, please take advantage of those if you are able. I want to thank you all so much for your faithfulness in this season with your offerings and your tithes and offerings and support. God has truly blessed our church, and uh, I pray that you are being blessed for your faithfulness in this season. Uh, our missionaries are funded and the bills are paid. So I just, I want to say thank you so much for your faithfulness, church. It's been incredible. Uh, if you would like to begin giving and tithing to Calvary Somebody God, the Grace Place, you're going to see a slide like uh, right now on your screen. It's going to tell you how uh, to give. We would prefer that you would mail your gift in to our mailing address that you see there, or you can take that address and you can plug it into your online banking bill pay and your bank can uh, mail us a check on your behalf. Uh, so those are the options that are available to you. I want to thank you again in advance for your faithfulness. Uh, I know God has truly blessed this church, and I'm just so grateful to be part of it. Uh, let's go ahead and pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all that you've done in this house, Father. I thank you for uh, everything that you've given us to be able to continue ministry, both online and in person, Father. And I just pray right now the special blessing upon everyone that gives today. May every penny that comes in be multiplied for your kingdom's glory. Bless our missionaries today, Father. Be with them wherever they're stationed all over this earth. I give you praise for all that you've done and all that's to come in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, it is my pleasure to present your lead pastor, Wes Beam. Welcome to church. I was um, just thinking over the last couple of days that um, we have been having church online since uh, March, and so it's like we've got this whole church that's um, gathering around um, computer screens and uh, whatever you're using to watch this today, and so we're so excited to um, bring church to you and grateful for the technology that gives us the ability to do that. Uh, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to bless the word today that I'm about to share. I'm excited to share it, and uh, we're on a journey together and and uh, just believing God to continue to grow each one of us closer to Him. And, uh, and I, I know that my, my heart is so full today because God's given me a lot, but my desire, uh, along with what I'm sharing with you, is that you'll receive it, that you'll grow in it, that you'll become a light, a beacon that will shine brightly for Him. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to speak your word today, God. I pray that um, you would just anoint it. Bless it, God. We know your word is already, has been inspired, has been anointed. Your Holy Spirit is, is breathing life through your word, God, into each one of our lives. And I pray today as your word goes forth, it will be impactful, uh, will challenge us, Lord, in areas where we need to be challenged, will call us up higher, will encourage us, God, today, and will, will bless us and strengthen us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are uh, walking through the uh, pages of the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, and uh, we're uh, uh, in the middle, we're actually beginning parts of a series called Living Renewed. And uh, I want to just share a scripture with you and then get right into Ephesians, and we're going to really be keen in on chapter two today. But um, I was this morning thinking about some words that uh, the Apostle Peter wrote in First Peter chapter 2, and um, Peter was uh, that one who uh, really was vocal and bold for God and, and uh, was, was probably one of the louder disciples, and uh, he just kind of had a way of just being out there. But I, I love to read First and Second Peter. I love the story of Peter's life. But um, he says in First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, but you are the ones chosen by God. 
chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you from nothing to something, from a, uh, rejected to accepted. And that is the, um, the message paraphrase. And I think it's so powerful to understand as we're getting ready to launch into this message today is that God has truly taken our lives. And I can only speak for me because it's my testimony, what God's done in my life. And he has renewed me. He has uh, transformed me. And so uh, just, just this word today, I think, is a picture even of what Peter is talking about, how God can take something that is nothing and he can create it and make it so wonderful as his presence fills it. And, and uh, so let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. This is kind of our key foundational scripture. Again, this is Living Renewed Part 3. But it says, if you have really experienced the anointed one and heard his truth, it will be seen in your life. So if God's changing us, then it'll be reflected in the way that we live. For we know that the ultimate reality is embodied in Jesus. And he has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of the ancient man, the old self-life, which was corrupt, corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from delusions. Now it's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within you uh, your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. And I want to connect with that, what Paul wrote, uh, wrote to us in Romans chapter 12, verses one through two and uh, from the Passion Translation. And it's, it is familiar, but it just, it talks about this, this renewing or this transformational process that happens in our lives. Paul says, beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine, genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the cults around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Now let's go back and just briefly recap the journey that we've been on through the book of Ephesians. In chapter one, Paul talks about this relationship that we have with God and, and uh, it, is, it is something so powerful that God is wanting to uh, continue to, to uh, grow in us and through us. We talked about how we've been blessed by God. We've been blessed by Jesus. We've been blessed by the Holy Spirit. And then last week we talked about prayer. We talked about powerful prayer. We talked about how prayer is simply you and I communicating with God and that we pray to God in the name of Jesus. And then it's so important to understand with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so think about that uh, in your own prayer time. And we, we also referenced and, and we used from the text the, the, uh, the words of Paul as he prayed for the believers in the church of Ephesus. And he prayed that they would know God, that they would know uh, his calling, that they would know his power. And so that is my prayer for your heart today and for your life today. And because I believe this, as we are followers of Jesus, that God's not called us to live aimless. God's not called us to live without purpose. And I believe that we have been empowered to do whatever it is that God has called us to do. And so we're going to continue our journey through the book of Ephesians today. And we're going to talk about the results or those things that happen in us and through us as we walk in a relationship with God. See, I believe it's important to understand that when we are connected with God, we are connected to his promises. And I believe this, that a partnership with God leads to a life that is transformed, a life that is changed. And so I believe that when we're being transformed, and I, I believe this with all of my heart today, that we are, we are overwhelmed by his presence when we're being transformed, that we can no longer live like we used to live, that there is a difference in our lives. And so... We can say this, we were once spiritually dead, and we're going to see this from Paul's writings today. We were, not, we were once spiritually dead, but I want to say today, I can again speak for my life, that because of Jesus, I am alive today. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. He says, so we're not giving up. 
How could we? Like, how can I stop serving God? I'm reminded of, of the disciples when Jesus was talking to them and people were leaving and, and uh, they, they, they were, you know, just, just watching all that happen. And Jesus was like, well, what are you going to do? And, and like, we, don't, we don't have anywhere else to go. It's only to you, Lord, that we have life and hope. It's only through you. And so we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart around us. How many would say, that's the story of my life right now? On the outside, things aren't looking too good. But on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. So on the inside, God is continually working. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. The lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow. But the things that we can't see now will last forever. And so the reality is we have to make a choice. Either we're going to choose to serve God, live in the light, live in his grace, or choose to live in a way that's not uh, even God honoring, uh, in a way that leads us back to our past. And I don't know about you, but if I've been saved out of the graveyard of sin, the graveyard of deadness, I don't want to be there anymore. I don't want to live there. I don't have the same mindsets. I want to have a different way of thinking. Reminds me of a story. There was a man who had been visiting the local bar, and he had become a little inebriated and was walking home, and, and there was a shortcut through a graveyard, a cemetery. And as he was walking along, unbeknownst to him, there had been a new grave opened up, and, and uh, so there was a big hole there in the darkness of night. And he, he steps into that hole, and he goes six feet down, and he's stuck. And as he's there in the bottom of that hole, he begins to become frightened and he begins to try to get out and he's running up the side of the wall and it started to rain and it's muddy and he realizes he can't get out. So he crawls in the corner the best he can to protect himself and he's, he's kind of you know, hiding away the best he can in the middle of all of that and falls asleep. Another gentleman happens to be walking through the cemetery and falls in the same hole. And he begins to try to get out of the, uh, the, the grave and try to, you know, get up out of that six feet and uh, get to the top. And, and he realizes that he can't. And all of a sudden, the man who was asleep in the corner wakes up and he reaches over, puts his hand on the other man's shoulder. And he says, guess what? You're not getting out of here. You're stuck. And the story goes like this. He did get out. He jumped six feet in the air and he ran all the way home. And you probably would too. And the whole point is this. We can either choose to stay in the deadness of our past or we can say, God, I don't want to be here any longer. And I believe this. Sometimes we have to, to really push to get out of that. But we have the help of the Holy Spirit. And so the point is this. We can live in the darkness of our past. We can justify why maybe things will never change. Or we can say, God, I'm allowing your Holy Spirit to work in my life to transform me because I don't want to be even what I was yesterday. And so my sermon title today, as we unpack Ephesians 2, is transformational living. God wants you to live transform. And the word transformational is an adjective that means the ability to make changes or to make improvements, the ability to change. Now, as many of you know, Chantel and I, my wife and I, we love to walk. It's a great way to explore. And I, I love to go to different places and walk new paths, new roads. And, and uh, it's, just, it's just something neat that we like to do together. And, and um, I, I love to walk and, and get to a place where there's a new horizon, step over a hill and, and see something that I've never seen before. But I also like to, as I'm walking, look back and see where I came from. It makes me appreciate where I am. And so I think that as I uh, begin to share this word with you, Ephesians chapter 2, this is so important. There's a principle that's so important to understand is that often we need to look back at the history of our life to appreciate where we are and where we're going. Now, I'm not encouraging you to live back there, but as you look back, it makes you appreciate how God has been so faithful in your life. And so Paul will remind us from Ephesians 2 that back there, the things back there were quite different, and now God has changed our lives. Those who've accepted Jesus that are walking in faith and obedience to him, that God is, is changing our life. And so Paul is going to encourage us in Ephesians 2 to look back and remember, but not to live back there. I, I think that's one of the reasons why the hymn Amazing Grace is so popular, because it, it's, it's a picture of I once was lost, 
but now I'm found. Like I was blind, now I see. We, we look back and see what we were, but then we can say, I've been transformed what I used to be. It's not what I am now. And so I want to just share some declarative statements. They're basically going to be my points today from Ephesians 2 to help us understand and talk about transformation living. So as a believer, I believe God wants us to live transformed. Back to Romans 12, 1 and 2. God says that we're to have a transformed mind, renewed mind, a different way of thinking. So the first declarative statement is this. I have been saved from spiritual deadness. I have been saved from spiritual deadness. Ephesians 2, 1 says this, once you were dead. So we could look back and say I was spiritually dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. The Amplified Bible says, in you, he made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins. Now, we all know this. It's a medical fact that our bodies are destined to die. No matter how much you work out, no matter how well you eat, all those things are good things. We can make that list go on and on and on. And again, those are all good. But the point is, no matter how we treat this physical body. We can make the quality of it better as, as the longer that we live and do our best to protect it and keep it well. But the point is that this body is destined to die. Now, Paul is not talking about physical death here. He is talking about spiritual death. Spiritual death is a soul that is separated from God. You see, I can be physically alive today. I can talk. I can have my five senses. But outside of Jesus Christ, I am spiritually dead. See, I believe this. It's important for you and I to understand without Jesus Christ, we are separated. Our spirit man is not alive. As many of you know, my father passed away this year, and, and uh, I remember standing by the casket, and, and uh, when someone passes away that you love on, you talk, talk about their life and the things that they enjoy, the things that they love. My, my father loved my mom's homemade cherry pies. He loved them, and uh, I've been in funeral situations as a pastor where people will put things in the casket that they, you know, the person enjoyed. And I told my wife, I said, put a jar of Jif peanut butter in the casket with me or a peanut butter sandwich, no jelly, peanut butter and bread. That's the way that I like it. And we, we talked about my dad and we laughed around his casket and I joke with my wife about that. But the point is my dad could no longer with his physical body enjoy a cherry pie because it wasn't alive anymore. And you could put all those things in my casket one day when I pass away, but I won't be able to enjoy them as I do now because that physical body is or will be dead at the point that it expires. And it's the same way with spiritual death. When before Jesus Christ, I was spiritually dead and I could not understand or enjoy the things of the Spirit. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 through 14. This is talking about how Jesus spoke in parables. This is the Amplified Bible. Jesus said, this is the reason I speak to the crowds in parables, because while having the power of seeing, they do not see. And while having the power of hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand and grasp spiritual things. In them, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will hear and keep on hearing, but never understand. You will look and keep on looking, but never comprehend. So this is Jesus explaining that we can be physically alive, but we could live in spiritual deadness. Now let's read on Ephesians chapter two, verses one through three. I'm going to go a couple more verses down the line. Paul says, and you he made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins in which you once walked. Now listen to what he says. You were following the ways of this world, influenced by this present age in accordance with the prince of the earth, Satan, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. Among these unbelievers, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by the sinful nature, indulging the desires of human nature, children under the sentence of God's wrath, just like the rest of mankind. And so as you begin to look at this, we're going to see the contributing causes of spiritual deadness. Now, when someone physically dies, often they do an autopsy and they'll come back to the family and they'll say, this is the cause of death or this is the reason why this person died physically. 
I believe also that there are causes of spiritual death. If we were to do an autopsy of a spiritual death, these are the reasons why we spiritually die. And so Paul outlines it here. First of all, he says the world, the world's systems and values affects us. It can rub off on us. It can indoctrinate us. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 7, this is a passion translation. It says, don't set the affections of your heart on this world or in loving the things of the world. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. In other words, they're not going to go hand in hand. For all that the world can offer us, the gratification of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, and the obsession with status and the importance, none of these things. None of these things come from the Father, but from the world. This world and its desires are in the process of passing away, but those who love the will of God live forever. You see, if I would go back to my father's casket and seeing him there laying his physical body was no longer alive, I know this, even though his physical body perished on this earth, and just a couple weeks ago, I went to where we had laid him to rest, and now he is under that ground, his physical body. But I know that his spirit is no longer there because it was quick in the day that he was born again. And he is at home alive in the presence of Jesus today. I believe that with all of my heart. But Paul says that we live forever as we align ourselves and come alive unto God. We also have to recognize that one of the causes of spiritual death is the enemy of our soul. Peter says in 1 Peter 5 8, be sober, well balanced, and self disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. The, of of, the enemy of yours, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. And so the enemy is out to destroy you. And Paul says it, it, this in Ephesians chapter 2. This is one of the causes of spiritual deadness. And then the last cause is this, the sinful nature. This is talking about our physical desires, our flesh that choose chooses or wants to control us. You see, we live in a fallen world. We have an enemy that, that wants to influence us, but also we have to deal with our own fleshly, physical desires. And that's why we need to be born again. That's why we have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, years ago, I, I think I heard this story. Someone talked about how, or read it, I'm not sure, but, but talked about how um, there were uh, two little boys and they were always having conflict, always just two brothers. And if you've got siblings, I've got two brothers and we just seemed like we would agitate one another. And finally, the mother one day, she watched the one boy, you know, he was just picking on his brother and, and uh, she said, why, why did you continue to do that? He had pushed his brother and he had kicked his brother. And he said, well, mom, he said, the devil made me push him. But he said, the whole kicking thing, I came up with that on my own. And uh, so you can see that, that we are, we're influenced by, by all of these things, by culture, by the world by the enemy of our soul, and by our own fleshy desires, our own, our own desires that are on the inside of us. Now look at Romans chapter 6, verses 21 through 23. I am so glad that we can come alive unto Jesus. I'm going to speak from my own life. I didn't need a resuscitation. I needed a resurrection. I needed to come alive because I was separated from God. And the moment that I accepted Jesus, my spirit came alive. Romans 6, 21 through 23. So tell me, what benefit ensued from doing these things that you're now ashamed of? It left you nothing but a legacy of shame and death. But now, as God's loving servants, you live in joyous freedom from the power of sin. So consider the benefits you now enjoy. You are brought deeper into the experience of true holiness that ends with eternal life. For sin's meager wages is death, but God's lavish gift is eternal life found in your union with our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So, so as we bridge into this second declarative statement, think about this. We were dead in our trespasses of sin. We were spiritually dead. We were disconnected from God. And Paul says that, that, that outside of God, there is no hope, there is no freedom, but because of God's grace, because of God's love for us, we have hope today and we can come alive. And so think about this. There is a defined moment. Number two, there is a defining moment that brings new life. Think about this declarative statement. There is a defining moment that brings new life. Listen to what Paul says, Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, I heard a man years ago preach a sermon, 
And he used that as a sermon title, and I think that was about the only two words that he would have used because he expounded on it in such a really cool way from that passage, Ephesians 2. But God, aren't you glad that God showed up? Paul says you were dead, you were separated, you were spiritually dead, but God, but God being so very rich in mercy because of his great and wonderful love with which he loved us, even when we were spiritually dead, there it is, and separated from him because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ. For by his grace, his undeserved favor, mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. And he raised us up together with him when we believed and seated us with him in the heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. So the moment that West Beam accepted Jesus, I became spiritually alive. I once was lost, but now I'm found. First Peter 3.18 says, Christ suffered and died for sins once and for all. The innocent for the guilty to bring you near to God by his body, being put to death and by being raised to life by the spirit. And then I love Romans 6, 4. We have therefore been buried with him through baptism and the death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory and power of the Father, we too might walk habitually in, a new, in newness of life, abandoning our old ways. So I am not who I used to be. You know, I might not be what I'm gonna be, but at least I'm not what I used to be. And I thank God that I'm alive today. I did a little word study on this Greek word, life. And there are three different words that mean life as you, you study it through the, 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 the New Testament. There's a word bios that is, has to do with the physiology of our body, our mass, our physical life. And we get the word biology from that. There's the word psyche that means life. And it's where we get uh, the word psychology. It deals with our personality, our soul. But then the word that Paul uses here is the word zoe. This has to do with our spirit. It is a part of us that is quickened, that comes to life when we come to God. It is a part that cannot live without God. It comes from God. It is a wholeness of life. And we receive that by grace, because of God's grace, through faith. And so Paul is using the word Zoe here because I'll speak for me when I came to God, when I came into a relationship with God, I already had bios. I had a physical body. I already had psyche, a soul, a personality. But God gave me Zoe life, life to the full. And it's the life that Jesus talks about in John 10, 10. He says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life, abundant Zoe life, life to the full. And so Ephesians chapter two, verses seven through nine, let's continue the journey through this great chapter. It says, throughout the ages to come, we will be the visible display of the infinite limitless riches of his grace and kindness, which was showered upon us in Jesus Christ. For it was only through his wonderful grace that we believed in him. Nothing we did could earn this salvation, for it was a gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ. So uh, one will ever be, be able to boast. No one will be, ever be able to boast, for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. So it all comes through relationship, by faith, through a relationship with God. And then number three, let's look at this last declarative statement. The life that is transformed is a productive life. The life that is transformed is a productive life. You see, I believe this. I don't have to do good works to get saved. I do good works because I am saved. Because goodness is alive on the inside of me. In Ephesians chapter two, verse, verse 10, it says, for we're his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used. Think about this. For good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. So God created works for us to do. We're, we're his masterwork and we're a work of art, but then he wants works to flow out of us. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focus habitually on the things above, heavenly things, not the things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value. For you died to this world, and your new, real life is hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is our life, appears, and you also will appear with him in glory. So, so there is this whole mindset shift. And, and because my mind is being transformed, my, my spirit is alive, it allows me to walk out this relationship in a way that is God-honoring, and it touches those around me. You see, I believe this today. If I am full of Zoe life, abundant life, it should be evident to everyone I come into contact with. There should be something different or unique about me. I love the story of Daniel in the Old Testament. It's an amazing story. One of the things I like about his life is that he was different. He, was, he, he stood out because of his relationship with God and how he honored God. And I believe God wants that for every one of us as that Zoe life is flowing through us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you so that you may always under all circumstance, regardless uh, of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him and have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. So I become full of him. My spirit is now alive. I, I have what I never had before I, he, he came into my life. And now I'm consumed by his presence. And now out of me flows life. And that life translates into works for him that, that, that brings glory to him. It just becomes a process of life. Titus 2.14, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and make us his very own people. Totally committed to doing good deeds. Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name, and don't forget to do good and share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. See, I believe God wants all of us to live a transformational life, a life that has been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit as we confess our need of God, as we confess Jesus as Lord of our lives. I want to read to you as we close today, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. I love 1 Corinthians 13 because I believe if my life has been transformed, it'll be easy for me to love others. It'll be easy for me to, you might say, well, pastor, there are people around me that are hard to love. And I know there are sometimes there are all those people, but as God's transforming me, it gives me the ability to love when I can't even love within my own ability. So listen to what Paul says. And I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. First Corinthians 13, four through seven. It says, love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to talk offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter. For it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat for it never gives up. Wow. So my prayer for you today is that you will live the transformed life, that, that you will look back at the landscape of your life and you will see throughout your journey God's hand that's been upon your life. And you will see that, yes, I used to be once I was, was back there, I was dead, I was, was lost. My spirit man was not alive. But now, because of Jesus, that one defining moment where I gave my heart to the Lord, my life was transformed, and I've never been the same from that day forward. And you might say, well, pastor, and I would agree with you, it's not been the easiest journey. God never guaranteed it would always be easy. He just guaranteed he'd be with you. But I can promise you this, as you continue to walk on this journey with God, his grace will be sufficient and he will continue the transformation process until the day you stand before him in eternity. And so I want to encourage you with that today. And if you're, you're listening to my voice today and you've not been transformed by, by, by a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you can have that today. You can come alive unto God. You might say, well, I really don't understand a lot of, uh, you know, the Bible. What is so cool about the Bible, the Word of God, is when we become transformed and we yield our lives to God, all of a sudden, the Bible, God's Word, begins to take on new meaning because now we're alive unto God. We have, we have understanding. We have hope because of the Spirit of God that's alive on the inside of us as we're alive. 
And so as I pray in just a moment, if you don't know Jesus, I believe you can come alive to Jesus today and you can say, Lord, I want hope today. We've never lived in a more hopeless day, at least in my generation. There's so many people without hope and we have hope today because Jesus, the son of God, gave his life so that we could have hope and we could be alive. And it's just as simple as saying, God, I realize that you sent Jesus to die in my place. I should be the guilty one. And God, I stand in your presence, guilty of whatever it may be. But Jesus, because of your work on the cross, you stood in the gap. I can be transformed and I can confess my need of you and I can be forgiven today and I can come alive unto you and I can have a transformation. And as I pray today, I'd encourage you, if you've never, never prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart, you do that. And if you're a believer today and you'd say, Pastor, I haven't been living as if I've been transformed, start living that way. Start looking back over Again, the landscape of your life, remembering how good God has been to you and start walking that thing out with faith and hope and saying, God, you have been faithful and God, you will be faithful. Shall we pray? Lord, today I am so thankful for your presence. I'm thankful that these words that the Apostle Paul wrote so many years ago are still relevant to this moment in this hour. And God, I pray that as people are listening to the sound of my voice today, Lord, that they will, they will be gripped by the hope that only comes from God, that the Holy Spirit will begin to, to come and speak into the, their hearts, God. And I pray for those that have never yielded their hearts to God, I pray they would come alive to Jesus today, that they would come alive to the reality that God loves them in an amazing way, and that as they, as they ask Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of their life, that God, they would become free, that they would become new, they would become whole. God, they would begin a whole new journey. And Lord, as, as you tarry, as we walk through this life together, that they, they would look back just like I've looked back over the years and said, God, I remember that moment where you transformed me. And God, they'll remember this moment, this day, where they said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I pray right now, God, right now, God, that, that, that as those are doing that, that you would just walk with them, Lord, that you would begin to reveal your heart to them, Lord, and you would begin to renew them and give them new and fresh life in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for those that, that, that maybe they've known you, Lord, like me at times in my life where I've become discouraged and frustrated even di felt disconnected from you, I pray, God, that we would continue to, to stay focused, Lord, we would continue to stay on point and realize that your grace is still there for us, God, that we have been transformed, but we are continually being transformed and we're becoming more like Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we would truly shine the light, the light of God throughout this world, Lord, that is so in need of hope. And Father, I thank you for it now. And I give you praise for your word. And God, I pray we would walk it out, Lord, that we would live with, with the reality of knowing that we're ambassadors for you in these days that we live. We give you praise and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I trust that you've been blessed by God's word today. I could just keep on preaching because it just fills me up. And uh, uh, here's, here's the cool thing about it. We just get to go and live it out. We get to be 1 Corinthians 13 and be love and light and hope to a lost world that needs Jesus. So God bless you. Have an awesome week. I pray it'll be the best week ever and you'll experience the, God, the presence of God and, and you'll just enjoy the fullness of relationship with him. God bless you.